Welcome to Terminal Value. So everything I do here at Terminal Value is based around one big question, and that is how do growth-oriented people transform their business and their life to achieve world-class levels of value in everything they do? That is the question, and I am here to bring you the answers. My name is Doug Utberg, and this is Terminal Value. I publish new podcast episodes five times per week. So make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any content. And also make sure to follow me on social. You can just look for the Doug Utberg handle. Please comment and let me know your thoughts. I'm looking forward to working together so that we can make your life amazing. We have Scott Anderson with us today with burnoutbreakthrough.com. And what we are going to be talking about is the burnout crisis and what can be done about it, specifically the burnout crisis in the United States of America. Although I think it's pretty safe to say that there's a burnout crisis more or less across the world, anywhere that is connected to the internet. So anyway, just like to introduce Scott for a second. Uh, in the pre-show, what we were talking about is some of the conditions of burnout, which I do not exactly recall. So I will let Scott share them. But when he told them to me, I said, so basically you're saying that more or less everybody is burnt out. And <laughs> that kind of ends up being sort of where the idea of a burnout crisis comes from. But anyway, I don't want to steal your thunder, Scott. Introduce yourself and talk to us a little bit about what burnout is, and then let's progress on to what could be done about it. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Great introduction. I'm glad to be here. I, you know, I think that's true. And it's so funny when you said that sort of the common denominator is anyone who's attached to the internet, that does seem to be kind yeah. of a root cause when you get right down to it. But yeah, we've been studying burnout. So I'm an executive coach and uh -huh. a licensed mental health therapist, as well as a serial entrepreneur. I'm on company number 10 and been at this for a long time and work with entrepreneurs who are struggling to scale their mm -hmm. businesses for a long time. And which kind of led naturally to burnout, both my own burnout and recovery from yeah. it as, as well as my clients. So yeah, one of the things a lot of people don't understand is because burnout's been our vocabulary for 50 years going yeah. back to a study in the 70s. What people don't realize is that burnout is regarded by both the World Health Organization and the American Psychiatric Association as a distinct illness. Uh, mm -hmm. as, a, uh, first of all, a bona fide illness, but something that's really distinct. And even though it has similarities to depression and sleep disorders yeah. and uh, anxiety, it's actually its own thing. And the three main symptoms the World Health Organization has identified are number one, exhaustion, a persistent exhaustion, mind, body, and spirit, where you're just bone tired. Yeah. And a good night's sleep doesn't help. It just doesn't do anything for it. So, or a vacation even, or even a sabbatical doesn't help. So that's number one. Number the two, absolute, even better is a vacation with your family. Yeah. Right. Which for anybody who's done that knows exactly what I'm talking about. Anybody who hasn't vacation with your family frequently involves having a lot of fun, but coming back usually with more anxiety than before you left. Right. Well, this is the problem, <laughs> right? With so many American, the myth is that we're going to work 50, we're going to kind of hold our breath for 50 working weeks in a row and then exhale for two yeah. weeks or one week. And typically it takes you know a huge amount of work to get ready to go and a huge amount of work to uncover your desk once you get back. And uh, the net result is you're still exhausted. So that's number one symptom is exhaustion that just doesn't go away. Well, no and actually, okay, so I promise only a 30 second tangent. This actually reminds me of, one of, the, uh, one of the ways I used to describe vacations back in the corporate days is I, I used to refer it as the privilege of shifting the time that you work. So like, yes. for example, I said, I go, okay, so if I'm going to go on vacation for a week, well, then that means I have to shift about 40% of the work that I do during that week into the week before and about 60% into the week after. Exactly. The total amount's exactly. no different. Exactly. <laughs> the total amount is no yeah. different. It's just, yeah. you're going to work twice as hard the week before you leave and twice as hard exactly. the week before you yeah. after you get back. <laughs> yeah, the idea of vacation or paid time off even more, yeah. just a myth. But This uh, is a distinctly American way of looking at things. It's like, well, how could that possibly result in anything bad? <laughs> yeah, this will work. This will work. And the funny thing is, is that both employers and employees sort of all buy into the same myth. Well, well, and I think there's a very good reason for that. And that's because I think, you know, ever since kind of the general electric Jack Welch management religion took hold, 
if you're in a professional corporate ladder type of career, then you're rated and ranked against your peers. Well, so that means if you fall too far behind, you end up at the lower end of the distribution. If you're at the lower end of the distribution too many years in a row, the next time that layoffs happen, then you're on the list, then you're out on the street. Exactly. Okay, if it's a hot market, you might be okay. Layoffs don't usually happen during a hot market, though. They usually happen during a cold market. And, you know, having been somebody who went through that layoff process right at the beginning of COVID when there were 40 million other unemployed people, let me tell you, it's not fun. (laughs) I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of apps, and I got ghosted on 99%. The most dehumanizing, well, not the most dehumanizing experiences, one of the most dehumanizing experiences in the digital contemporary age. Yeah, I think the only thing more dehumanizing than being on the the 40 million unemployed is being on the, you know, 150 employed, because especially one of the funny things, I'll digress with you, but yeah. one of the things I noticed with 30 second clients, tangents are allowed, you don't even ask, okay. ask permission. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. I'm in a tangent safe zone. One of the things I noticed with my clients in COVID that was really interesting was that versus uh, 2008, mm-hmm. during the Great Recession of 2008, it took employers about a year to really grasp what was happening mm-hmm. and that this was a really bad problem. We could all feel it in our 401ks and we could all see the stock market, but I don't think anyone had the full grasp of it. And so employers were rather slow to make the cuts. Not so in, in 2020. You know, In March of 2020, I've never seen anything like it. There was just an immediate pivot. And most employers, in retrospect, would say they cut too deep, but they were definitely not going to be caught with their pants down as they were in 2008. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it was just the most amazing pivot I'd ever seen. And what happened as a result, and this is why I say it's dehumanizing to be among the unemployed, but it's you know just as dehumanizing, or at least just as difficult to be the remaining employees, because what happened during that period was the lucky ones who retained their jobs had to pick up all the slack there was. And a lot of companies had their best years ever, oddly, in 2020, because they made those huge pivots. And they went into a a cycle that I call sprint as marathon, where we used to have these sprints, and then we'd take a deep breath or a vacation or something. But now sprint is SOP. There is no tape that you break. It's just sprint all day, every day, no matter what. Reminds me of the that's, old demotivational. That's what we're in yeah. now. Reminds me of the old despair.com demotivational poster. It said, you know, the race for quality has no finish. So technically it's a death march. Yes. Right. <laughs> those posters are so funny. Oh, so, I, I, so I love those. True. <laughs> I just love them so much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think I actually, I think when I did my entrance essay for grad school, I think I actually referenced despair.com as a company that I admired because I think that yeah. that was the point where they did, they did the spoof class action lawsuit where they tried to copyright the colon, the frowny face colon and presidency. Yes. Right. And so I think that right. they said they were planning on individually suing two and a half billion internet users. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. They're very clever people. Yeah, they're extremely clever. I'll try to salvage this tangent, but we were talking about the symptoms of, of burnout. Yeah. And the first one is this bone tired despair dot kind of existential exhaustion. Yeah. And it's the kind where, and I've talked to people and I've experienced it, unfortunately myself, where you wake up in the morning and you think, I hope not, but today might be the day I'm not going to be able to get out of bed. Today's the day where I hope not, but I'm really afraid it could be the day where I just can't make it happen. I can't bubble gum and bailing wire this thing yeah. together one more day. And that's the real terror of mm-hmm. the people that I've worked with is it's not just how much longer can I keep doing this before somebody sees that I'm mailing it in or before somebody sees that I'm an imposter or a fraud. Yeah. But it's even worse than that. It gets to a point with a lot of people where they're afraid. I'm afraid that I can't even show up as a fraud. I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to get to my desk or turn on Mm -hmm. Zoom. So that's part of it. The second symptom is that goes right along with it is a disconnection from things that you were formerly passionate about or at least cared about and where it becomes really difficult to have to feel any connection to why you got up in the morning, either to run your own business or to lead people in another company, that it's really hard to find your purpose anymore. And the things that used to be exciting, and unfortunately, this can spread with burnout to not just work, but also at home. And then you have spouses asking you, you know, where are you? You're with us physically, but you're Mm -hmm. not present. You're like a a shell, you know, you're you're in the same room, but you're not with us. Anybody who's heard that knows how painful those words can be. And then the third 
most serious end of the, and at this point, it's sort of the canary in the coal mine, but there's a transition from feeling isolated and disconnected to feeling resentful and angry. Uh And that's the crispiest, most dangerous part of burnout. If you hit that point where you really are resenting even your customers or your business partners or your colleagues or potentially family members in case that comes home as well. So that's sort of the problem. And as you said, you know, as we discussed pre-show, Gallup says that 45, north of 45% of the American workforce currently report that they are mostly or always burned out, which yeah. is the highest. They've been measuring disengagement for a long time, and this is the highest ever by far. Mm-hmm. And in fact, it hasn't gone down. It's actually gone up since the end of COVID, quote, in April of 2021. It's actually, these statistics have actually gotten worse. And this sprint as marathon business model has unfortunately has continued, even with people who are, quote, quietly quitting. So it's a real problem, not only because it's just not sustainable. This sprint as marathon is not sustainable. And we have to find a way and we have discovered some ways for businesses to, to turn the corner here, not only to treat people who are burned out, but also to create a culture that is inherently prevents burnout. All right. Well, I think we've polished the problem very well. Anybody who wasn't <laughs> depressed when they started listening to this, uh, yeah. this interview, has, I'm sure we've got them there now. So let's turn and talk about what we can do about it. Let's do. Yeah. The good news is, is that there are proven evidence-based techniques that really do reverse burnout and can do so relatively quickly in, uh-huh. in our experience in 90 days or less, if people will make a a real effort to follow some evidence-based practices and also can remove it permanently. I mean, that's Mm -hmm. my experience personally, as well as hundreds of the folks we've worked with is that one day they sort of realize as I did, wow, the burnout's gone. So that's the good news. There are proven techniques that really work. The bad news kind of is that these techniques are not what people would normally go to. Our mind's intuitive reaction to problems is to either fix it or avoid it, to either Mm -hmm. fight or flee. And neither of those solutions work with burnout. In fact, they make burnout worse, which is why most people in trying to treat their own burnout by either trying to make the thoughts and the feelings or the physical sensations go away, or even more dangerous to avoid them by uh, social media, alcohol consumption, of course, dramatically increased over COVID and and these kinds of things. And I was going to tongue in cheekingly say, I mean, the way that we deal with problems in an American way is we get angry with the people who are close to us and develop addictions. You know, that's that's it. (laughs) Exactly. It's it's been going on for centuries. It it just accelerated lately. It really has. And to a dangerous degree, you know, the consumption of alcohol, the incidences, domestic violence have increased dramatically. And, you know, unfortunately, and it's not our fault, our minds are designed to You know, whether it's to change a flat tire or split the atom, our brains are really designed to solve problems. But when it's thoughts and feelings, our brains can't really make thoughts and feelings go away. And any attempt to avoid them does result typically in some form of addictive or at least dangerous behavior. If I can restate what you're saying, I think the way that I would say that in a little different way is that our brains are trained to address solvable problems. You know, because right. like, for example, right. you know, if you're talking changing a tire, okay, you know, the tires change or it's not, you know, when you're done, if you're exactly. saying, okay, you know what, I want to help my spouse feel contented. Yep. A little different, a little when, different problem. When's that done? <laughs> exactly. When, when you get to mark that off the list. <laughs> and, you know, this is one of the reasons why so many of the people we work with come to, you know, what we're really talking about are repetitive thoughts and emotions, disturbing thoughts and emotions that they want to go away. So, you know, and a lot of people have a persistent thought or emotion that has the word enough in it. I'm not Mm -hmm. experienced enough. I'm not skilled enough. I'm not confident enough. But the problem, just like contentment with your wife, is what is enough? Yeah. The other problem is to try to make that thought go away is very similar to saying to ourselves, don't think about pink elephants. Don't think about pink elephants because it tattoos pink elephants on our brains. So every attempt we make to make the thought go away actually makes it come back stronger. Same way with avoiding it. Any attempt to avoid pink elephants still has pink elephants embedded in it. The good news is there are lots of techniques, counterintuitive though they may Uh be, that are simple and practical and really, really work. And a lot of it has to do with just noticing 
to begin with, to just notice the thoughts that we're having and to have a level of acceptance that you're right. Solvable problems our brain can knock out, but disturbing thoughts and emotions our brain cannot. Yeah, not so much. Not in the same way. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, and then I think the other two, right, is, you know, when, as you're going through this kind of burnout process, you end up having some disturbing thoughts and emotions. And then assuming that you're not a sociopath, which most people aren't, you'll feel bad about it, which then yes. kind of creates this reinforcing cycle. Exactly. Exactly. You know, one of the other aspects that's kind of counterintuitive, and it goes back to this vacation work shift that you talked about earlier. One of the things that makes recovery from the loss of energy, the exhaustion mm -hmm. part so difficult is because we do think often as Americans and we have clients in Europe and the UK yeah. think the same way. But the idea is I'll rest on the weekend or I'll rest when I get home or I'll rest on vacation. But all the evidence around burnout suggests that simply doesn't work. And that what we have to, what does work is to take brief mini vacations, yeah. we call them throughout the day. That really the only way to um, to release stress and maintain a high level of energy is to release stress persistently and consistently throughout the day by taking what we call mini vacations. So uh -huh. it's very, very simple directions and very simple actions. You don't have to meditate per se, but what we do have to do is sort of acknowledge I'm feeling stressed out, take a deep breath and let that go. And if we can do that five or 10 times a day, when we notice that we're yeah. stressed, you really can prevent burnout as well as recover from it. Yeah, I think that's really good. Well, because I think I like it because A, it's something that's pretty concrete and B, it's yes. something that's fairly simple, not overly complicated and something that anyone exactly. can do. What else you got for us? We're on a roll here. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, this is the thing. I mean, our program, the Burnout Breakthrough System is designed knowing that the folks we're trying to help are burned out and therefore are in a kind of despair speaking of despair.com. And so all of the techniques are- yeah, I'm not even designed. an affiliate of them. I, I just like their yeah, stuff sure. so much. Yeah, I sure. Go, I, should, I should actually sign up. I'm sure they no, have an affiliate should. program. Everybody does, but I yeah, I'm, I, I go, I'm not affiliated in any way. I don't make a nickel if anybody buys their stuff. Call them up. It's not too late. <laughs> but uh, yeah, when the folks we work with are in that loop. And so the, the system that we've developed specifically understands that you know, you're not capable of, of uh, 30 minutes of meditation every day. All of the interventions are intentionally small and uh -huh. practical and something that anybody can do and everybody can do every day. But the difference is it's not so much about learning all kinds of science. It's really about implementing little techniques. And a lot of it has to do with focusing on the one thing you're working on right now, uh -huh. a basic mindfulness, being where your hands are, as a friend of mine says. And so you may have heard of a technique called the Pomodoro technique, Yes. but the idea is to set an alarm clock or a timer, your wristwatch for 25 minutes and work at yep. a specific yep. task for 25 minutes. But when the 25 minute timer goes off to intentionally take five minutes to get up from your desk, walk around, you know, sprint, but allow there to be a rest period yep. at the end of the sprint. And it's that recovery period, just like physical exercise, just as if we were training for uh -huh. an Olympic event, the recovery periods are as important as the work periods, maybe more so. Well, and, but and Pomodoro actually, was, is a great technique. Yeah, I was going to say, and there's actually a, uh, there's a little bit of, little more nuance in the Pomodoro technique, because if you're going to do it right, what you're supposed to do is focus exclusively on one thing for 25 exactly. minutes with no exactly. external distractions. So exactly. Means either turn off the internet or like have exactly. no tabs, just like one thing. 25 minutes, and then exactly. you can disengage. You know, exactly. No messages, nothing. And that's the hardest thing, I think, for Americans to do, because we another myth most of us accept in whole cloth is the idea that yeah. we can multitask. And of course, the science is in on this. Yeah. You can't multitask. We can toggle sometimes quickly between two things, but those two things will suffer in their execution, yeah. as will our mental health. If we attempt to do two things, that just you know, text and drive on the interstate, this is multitasking at its finest. It's not a good way to go. And both things get compromised. But that's exactly right. Pomodoro is about being single-minded and single-focused. And it gets back to the internet again, that sort of uh, root of all evil. But to the extent that we can just acknowledge we can only do one thing at a time and put everything we've got into that one thing is not only a cure for burnout, but it also helps prevent it. 
Yeah, well, and I think one analogy that I've heard is that, you know, you're trying to do focused work while you're connected to the internet. It's like trying to work on an airport runway. I mean, I suppose exactly. it's possible. Yeah, <laughs> it's exactly. It's possible, but you're not going to get your best work done. Exactly. Now, I think that's a really good analogy, but that's exactly right. And, you know, again, it's the level of stress. I mean, imagine the level of stress of work on a runway. Yeah. It's very, very stressful to try to do more than one thing at a time. And the work really suffers. The illusion that we have is that if I'm not doing five things at once, then I'm not doing my job or going back to the Jack Welsh forced rating yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, card that we have to do five things at once to merely have our noses above water, to merely be competitive. We yeah. have to do the work of five people and it's simply not possible. Correct. All right. Well, let's see. So I think we've talked about kind of taking some breath breaks and I guess could say meditation, although that's not necessarily, uh, it doesn't necessarily fully correlate, but we'll call it meditation no. for the time being. We we're taking some breathing breaks. We talked about kind of segmenting what we're doing into Pomodoro sized chunks. What else you got for us? You know, one of the, the main things that we found is once we give people some basic skills so that they can operate in a way that will at least not increase their burnout and ideally will decrease it over time. One of the things that we found that is really essential is to shift the orientation or the true north for, for our clients from trying to placate bullying thoughts and, I, and emotions because we spend so much time just trying to make them be quiet. And it's a ultimately a, a fruitless enterprise. But what we once we get to the folks to the point where they can kind of manage and neutralize the disturbing thoughts and emotions, we want to direct them to rediscovering or sometimes discovering for the first time what their real values are. Or in other yeah. words, what really makes life life for them, what makes life worth living for them. And to change the focus away from bullying thoughts and emotions to what it is we really want to do and who it is we really want to be. That is a, a real true north that'll build you a good life. Because the problem with trying to make these thoughts about being a fraud or whatever yeah. go away is that, as Lily Tomlin once said, if you win the rat race, you're still a rat. There's no real victory in that. So we try to, we, what we ask people to do is to get crystal clear about what their values are, not so much in terms of a moral ethical sense, but more in terms of what do you want in your tombstone? What do you want to yeah. be able to be grateful for at the end of your life? And really pursue those things and change the orientation to a true north that really will build you a better life. And that's a huge shift. But when that happens, each of us every day is capable of living in a way that's consistent with our values. And if it is impossible, then we can make shifts so it is possible. And yeah. that really will build a life worth living. Whereas chasing phantoms like, am I a fraud? Am I smart enough? Am I pretty enough? Am I confident enough? is, as you say, there's no enough, there's no answer to that question, and yeah. there's no real lasting fulfillment. Correct. I like that true north idea, although there's always a part of me that thinks, I go, okay, well, you know, when I'm dead, I'll be dead. <laughs> In 500 years, nobody alive will know who I was. But on the other hand, I'm not trying to backslide into nihilism. So, so let's just yeah. veer back yeah. on topic. It's not about the end of life, although that's part yeah. of it. But I, what it really is, is let's live life today in a way that is worth living. Because the real problem with living according to either others' expectations or what we imagine they expect, or especially trying to, to live up to thoughts and emotions that are never going to be satisfied, is to live a life that really is worth living today, right this moment. And we uh -huh. can do that. Everybody can do that. Even in the most dire circumstances, it is still possible to behave in a way that's consistent with who you want to be in your life. And yeah, that's a complete shift. Yeah, absolutely. Completely. And I was being a little tongue in cheek there, but I think that really is important because say if there's one hopeful silver lining that's come out of the whole COVID experience is that, you know, I think a lot of people, you know, myself included have kind of been, you know, shaken out of the, okay, you know, just kind of keep going the way you're going to saying, Hey, look, this, something's got to change here. Exactly. I don't necessarily know all of what it is, but this isn't working. <laughs> Exactly. I think that the existential question that a million people really died and yeah. people are continuing to die every day now from COVID as well as other things. But yeah. I think it really did, certainly for me and for a lot of people, it just it made, brought that into, into real context in a way that brought our daily lives into an existential context that wasn't that maybe we could have avoided more easily before. 
Yeah, completely. All right. Well, I think this has been a great conversation. Give us one or two last thoughts there. Throw out your website one more time. I'll put it in the show notes too. And then let everybody know where you're most active on social. Sure. Well, we're pretty active in Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok even. (laughs) So we're pretty active everywhere, but go to Uh burnoutbreakthrough. And there's a, a free masterclass explaining the not only the causes, but the but the five shifts that we've discovered that really will help you break through burnout quickly and permanently. The other thing, and I'll, I'll give you this as a link, I'll send you a, an email, Doug, but we have an online burnout assessment tool mm-hmm. that's really helpful for people to understand whether they're burned out or not, and in the context of the World Health Organization definition of burnout. So I'll send you that as an email, but it's a really good fast, but really accurate predictor of where you are with burnout. Got it. That makes sense. All right. Well, Scott, really appreciate your time today. My pleasure, Doug. Thank you. All right. Hey, thanks for watching to the end of the video. There's just a couple of things that I need from you right now. Number one is I need you to subscribe. If you're not already a subscriber to the channel, please hit the subscribe button and turn notifications on. That way you will know every time I publish new content. Number two, comment, share your thoughts. I want to know what you did and didn't like. What should I make next? And number three, share this with your friends. Go on to Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn, wherever you uh, you hang out socially, and then post a link to this video and let people know what you liked about it and make sure to tag me. And then what I would also like to do is I would like to offer you the most incredible free gift ever. And this is related to my business where I help other businesses reduce their contract related costs. If you are a decision maker in a business, then I want to talk with you to see about how we can address your contract costs and drive savings. If you know somebody who is a business decision maker, then I would like you to help me get in contact with them. And in exchange, I am going to give you a absolutely free vacation at one of 30 places across the United States with no obligation and no timeshare pitch. Uh, The value of this, again, depending on how much savings we achieve, can literally be between thousands and millions. So anyway, just hit the button below for the most incredible free gift ever. Make sure to subscribe, share, and comment, and watch the next video because I'll be at you with more.